in a lovely way that the worship has been conducted and so we're bringing together uh, just drawing to conclusion our, our series on a new season um, before I start that you know I don't know if Bobby can find it or not on there but you know that song 10,000 reasons could you pull up the last verse is that possible yeah just, yeah there's no rush um, the uh, it was composed by the worship leader whose name has just escaped me actually um, that's the one thank you um, of the largest Anglican church in, in the UK, which is Holy Trinity Brompton. Um, and um, one day when he was leading worship in what, of course, is his local church, and by this time this has been sung all over the world, he told this very moving story. Some of you may have heard it, and I cannot sing this last song without feeling moved. That when ISIS, um, in one particular part of their, what was their empire, which is, thankfully is now diminished uh, greatly, they were lining up Christian young men, uh, hooded, um, ready to be executed. And so they were standing in line, uh, the orange hoods on them and all this kind of thing, uh, one after the other. And they were singing that song. Now, they were singing that song. And as they approached the end of their thing, and on that day when my strength is failing. Well, sorry, I can't read it even. Anyway, but... When we talk about having a new season, thank God we've got the opportunity to have a new season. Um, we think of our Christian brothers and sisters in all denominations around the world who are really suffering for their faith and being persecuted for the faith. And more people today are dying for the faith than um, at any time in, in, in the last 2,000 years. By the time I finish my message, 100 martyrs will have died for their faith somewhere around the world. And this gives you an idea. So when God gives us the opportunity and the freedom that we enjoy to move into a new season, a different dimension, and it behoves us probably, gives us an even greater responsibility to respond positively to what God wants to do. Um, what a setting we're in, whether you choose to come here next year or not, what a great setting it is, isn't it? And I can remember when I, many years when I was a young minister, I'd never been to Switzerland actually uh, until recent years. Uh, but there was an illustration I remember using a lot, a lot in, a, in a message, and it, it couldn't be, I, have to, I shared it actually with some friends yesterday uh, when we were having coffee together, and it, the story is of, and you may well have heard it, because obviously if you're Swiss you, you know the story, that um, there was an area not dissimilar from this, it was a, a, probably a smaller vision, a large lake, and it was fed by uh, a, a mountain stream. And the mountain stream supplied, uh, there's a small stream that comes in about there, but the whole lake was, was uh, fed by this. And there was a man who lived, he was a hermit, and he lived at the top of the mountain. And his job was just to keep the, the source stream clean. And uh, if there was any rubbish in the way, he moved it out of the way. And, and it worked very well, and it was a very prosperous thing. There was a lot of wildlife, wildlife broke tourists, tourists broke, brought a good economy. But one day, as often is the case, somebody decided that they need to cut costs and the town council met together and somebody looked at the balance sheet and said, who's this guy we've never even heard of who lives up in the hills? He never even comes down hardly. We don't see him. Why are we paying him so many Swiss francs every year to, to work for us? And so they, they, somebody sent him a message, we're not employing you anymore. Um, we don't need you. But what happened was he stopped his job and the stream didn't happen overnight, but what happened slowly, the... Um, the stream became toxic, and then the lake became toxic, and then the wildlife stopped coming, and then the tourists stopped coming, all because the source, remember what we said before, God doesn't look on the outward, he looks upon the heart. And it's the source, what we draw upon, we have to keep our spirits clean. Our inscape, it absolutely, um, it, it makes sure whether our landscape is going to be working for us. So uh, what's, what, what am I going to conclude with today? And we're going to conclude with this um, when do we start into a new season? When do we do that? Uh, what is the best time to go into a new season? And the answer is simple. The answer is now. Now is always the time. You know, I, as I travel around different churches, different denominations, and I probably would be um, a lot within other denominations more than the one I was actually where my roots were. I, I, f I find something that's I don't think it's strange I think it's probably always been there but I've only just noticed it in recent years the churches sometimes they live in the past so if people are say like my age group which is obviously older um, 
you find people say, oh, do you know, it's all right now, and we've got a lovely minister, and we've got great elders, and we've got a good church, but, you know, John, if you'd been here in years gone by, in the 1950s, that was when it was really great. You know, you miss, we've all missed, and so they live in yesterday, and the talk is of yesterday. More often, and incidentally, Ecclesiastes 5 says this, it is, it is not wise to say, why were the old days better than these, for it is not wise to ask such questions. And the reason why is because we have rose-colored glasses, um, we always remember the good things about yesterday, and we don't remember the bad things about yesterday. <laughs> um, we're very selective in our memories. Then, more often than not, it's not people who live in the past, and particularly, I have to, I've got to be honest, it's, it's mainly from people from my kind of background, church background, they tend to live in the future. And they say, oh, you know, somebody came a great, gave a great prophecy over our church, and we can't wait for that to happen. And so actually... They're, they're not living in the past, they're living on the day when things will change, you know what I mean? One day it's going to be better, somewhere around the corner there's going to be revival. And it's strange that revival's always around the corner. And if you keep going around enough corners, you actually go around in circles, chasing revival, chasing this great new day. And so what happens is, if we live in yesterday, and we, are we live in tomorrow, we never experience what God wants to do in the day. Uh, we just live in a, a kind of no man's land, and I'll come to the idea of no man's land in a moment. You see, procrastination is not just the thief of time. Procrastination is also the thief of blessing. Uh, because if we don't live in the now and, exp and, and really respond to God in what he's doing, we lose out a lot. You see, in the natural, what happens when we're kids, what happens? We say, I can't wait for the day when I'm grown up and mum and dad don't tell me what to do all the time. You know, my mum and dad are controlling my life. One day I'm going to be an adult and that'll be a great day. And so they, we grow up and we get to be young adults and we say, oh, it's great, you know, being in control of my destiny and my life a little bit, uh, but it's going to be awesome when I get married. When I get married, it's going to be amazing. So people get married and say, you know, it's great being married, but... Life will be complete when I get kids. And so the kids come. And then a few years go by and they say, you know, it's great having kids, but it'll be great when they leave home. <laughs> you know? It'll be great when they go to university and we'll get the house back and get my budget back and start spending money on ourselves instead of the kids. And so that'll be great. And so then the kids go to university or get, go to some job and they say, well, you know, it's great, you know, we've got a house for self, but I still got to go out early in the morning to work and all oh, that commute's awful. It'll be great when I retire. And so people retire, and then they say, if only I was younger. <laughs> if only I was fitter. If only I was stronger. And so it's not just we in church that live in, in tomorrow or yesterday. We think everybody seems to do it. And it robs us of what God wants to do in our lives in, in time to come. Somewhere my notes are here. I probably don't need them all the time, but just to keep on track to watch the time today. Now, and... We talked a lot about, and particularly yesterday, I don't want to go too much into the stuff because we've done what we needed to talk about uh, yesterday. I want to end on a kind of a continually positive note. But there are times in our life when we ha now is the time to relinquish things that we shouldn't be holding on to. Okay, that, there is a now moment for that. And uh, all of us experienced a very important now. Everyone in the room has come to the place where somebody presented the gospel. It may have been a preacher in a pulpit. It may be a, a friend in a, in a cappuccino bar who told us about Jesus. Uh, it could have been somebody we met on holiday. It could be a neighbor. But there was a moment when we heard the word, somehow, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Uh, we heard what it says in Isaiah, Come now, let us reason together. Though your sins be like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. So everyone in the room, we've accepted that now, uh, I assume, I hope so anyway, and that as in now is an important thing. But then even as Christians, if we've looked over various stuff of things which block our well, or, or things even when we block other people's well, there's a time to deal with those problems, and we saw last night that that was in the now. Um, I don't want to use too many, they say if you use two, win, illustrations are a window on a sermon, and if you use too many illustrations, you're living in a greenhouse uh, instead of a, a message. But there's a very pertinent and very important illustration about the now. Uh, Mal and I lived for 16 of our years, uh, of our 47 years in, of marriage, in Scotland, which we absolutely love and we still miss in many ways. Uh, not so much for the weather, but we love the people. And... Um, there's a story of a, a, a time when people were hill This one man was hill walking on a, a... I would never go out in the kind of freezing weather this person went in. But he used to walk the hills at all times. And, and it was incredibly um, 
uh, an inc incredibly freezing environment. And he's not by a big lake, but he's by a river, and it's a fast-flowing river. And he sees something, he thinks it might be a log or something, a tree trunk, that is floating along with the current of the river. And he just gets out his binoculars and he finds it's not a tree trunk. It's a dead animal, it might be a deer or something, it might be a large sheep, and it's, uh, it's frozen and it's sort of just going along as it's passing by. And then as he's got his binoculars trained, he sees this great big bird of prey come down and think, wow, this is my, this is Meals on Wheels or Meal, Meals on Waves. You know, this is a great time to have a free lunch. And so it, it gets its talons into the thing, the carcass, and it starts pecking around. Well, I find that the birds in my garden, even little birds and in your garden, when we put food out for them, and Marilyn, I think, you know, if it came to the last food in our house, would it be the, would it be the, uh, uh, the birds that get it, or me? The birds, I think, will win. I mean, she looks after the birds in our garden. But even when they peck around, you know, we notice them, they're looking around, aren't they, for security's sake, if it's safe to continue eating. But he noticed that this bird was doing more than that. It was a huge bird, and it was pecking, and it was not so much looking around, but looking out into the distance. And he said, what's this bird looking at? And then he saw that the, the river, which he thought was just a continual river, actually there was a huge water precipice. There was a waterfall. And the bird was thinking, how long can I stay eating before I have to let this thing go over the waterfall? And he kept... But the bird just seemed to keep on to the few more meters, a few more meters, won't let go of it yet, won't let go of it yet. And then it's a few meters from this great big watery cliff and it decides this is the time to go, now's my time, flaps its wings. Didn't realize that while it was eating, its talons had become frozen to the carcass. So when the carcass went over, it went over. Now, remember what we said about yesterday, God speaks in the innermost man, then it goes to our mind, emotion, and will, and then at some time later, uh, we get to the point when we actually do something about what God has said, but sometimes the window's gone. Sometimes it's too late. And when we hear God and respond to God in the now, it's never too late, obviously. So there are times to, to relinquish, but then, and this is what I want us to go in the final moments of our time of retreat together, and incidentally on the tree, I've one of the things Marilyn and I appreciate so much, but, but the, the scenery has been the fellowship. And uh, we've had um, conversations with loads of people on a one-to-one, -one, just not about necessarily spiritual things or anything to do with church, but just saying hi and getting to know a little about you. My apologies, if I, um, I won't have been able to speak to every single person. And if Marilyn and I have not you know, spent a meal with you or something like that, or been at your table, please forgive us. I'd have loved to have done that. There's just not enough space in the, in the program to do it. But the intention would have been there, and we hope uh, that uh, you understand that. But now I want to go into the time. There's time to relinquish, but here we come to the next part. This is very important. There's the time to grasp. And so in the story of the bird and on surfing the uh, carcass, uh, that was a time to leave, but there's a time to grasp. You'll know that Israel, um, the story of the spies, and that kind of thing we were talking about before, they wandered round in circles for years because they didn't hear the words of the spies. You know, a democracy is a great thing, but it's not always brilliant. Twelve spies went to spy in Canaan, ten were people of no faith, a couple were people of faith, they went with the consensus and as a result of the consensus, they went round in circles for years. Eventually, they got to the edge of the promised land, and a whole generation had gone by, and so uh, the leaders of Israel said, wait a minute, God gave us the law through Moses, but now they'll have forgotten the law. So the book of Deuteronomy that you have in, we have in our Bible, the book of Deuteronomy is the restating of the law on the edge of the land. So they had this land in front of them, land flowing with milk and honey, and God says, a lot of times gone by, a lot of circular going around in circles has gone on. You need to hear the law, law, law again, because we're about to move forward. And in Deuteronomy 1, there is this amazing verse. It says, you have encompassed this mountain long enough. It is time to break camp and move into the place that God has got for you. We'll call that not a promised land. We'll call that a new season. Are you following me? Now, why were they circulating, uh, circulating around the mountain? It is because they were, they'd become, um, I'm going to watch the words I use because for those who don't have English as a, a first language, um, 
prevaricating, you know what I mean? They, they were indecisive because of this reason. They were in quite a comfortable position. There was a new season ahead of them, but some of them were thinking this, wait a minute, there was a time when we can remember a generation of slavery where we were making bricks without stone and uh, we had people, if we weren't working fast enough, we were getting hit, we weren't getting enough food. Uh, we're not there anymore. And if we go into this new day, this new season, it might be wonderful, but the, there are enemies that live in that land and it's going to be quite a challenge. It's going to be, this fight's going to be going on here and it's fairly comfortable where we are. We're not in slavery, we're not in great blessing in a new season, but it's, it's a new season so important that we have to have the challenges. And so they'd become complacent. They'd got, if it was military terms, we'd say it was a no man's land. It wasn't in the safe place of our own, of, of our own troops, and it wasn't advancing into an enemy's territory. It was a, a safer place, although in, in, if you, my grandfather was in the First World War, and no man's land was not a safe place, because that's the place where he really got shot up. And so there was a time, it says in Deuteronomy 1, the Lord your God says, you have stayed long enough at this mountain, break camp and advance. See, I have given you this land, Go in and take possession of the land that the Lord swore he would give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so what we can do in church is we can say, you know, it's, I say, you know, whatever the background and stuff that may be going on or have gone on, you know, it's a great church. I mean, I sat in your congregation in, uh, a few weeks ago on a Sunday morning just as a guest and a visitor. Uh, and I really enjoyed the worship. I enjoyed everything about the meeting, everything about it. It's a great church. But, you know, the issue is not about being, uh, having a great church, uh, or a good church, I should say. The issue is really have the best church that God wants in your area. That is, that is the challenge. That, that is the good thing, that whatever we're experiencing that's good. I mean, I'm sitting here this morning, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm just... I'm not saying because obviously the musician is in front of us, but just the kind of songs that we're singing, the kind of atmosphere, the ambience is just a blessing. You know, I feel refreshed just by being in the worship here. And we can get complacent because we enjoy it. We've, some of you've got, um, I can say you because I don't have a stressful job, I'm retired from the role I had. And some of you have pressurized job, responsible positions. Um, uh, and some of you may not have like, high power jobs. I don't know. I don't know what you do. But certainly you have challenges. You have to pay the bills at the end of the month. And uh, when you get to church, you say, hey, listen, let's just relax on a Sunday morning. Enjoy a few songs. Uh, enjoy preaching, the preaching of the word. Enjoy fellowship and a cup of coffee with our friends. Or in your case, you have a meal, don't you, sometimes after the morning meeting. Instead of a biscuit, a gypsy cream we get in England, you get a meal. Uh, <laughs> We get a cup of coffee and a gypsy cream and you have a meal. Um, it's great. So, you know, right, John, new season, it's all very wonderful, but we've got to pressurise life Monday to Saturday. Sunday's the time to relax. And when we don't advance in the now, we lose out all that God has got for us. Because however good now is, the future is better when we move into God's blessing. Now is the time to grasp. And it's interesting, he says, he, he, God references Abraham. Because we know that Abraham moved out from the land in which he was, Ur of the Chaldees, uh, or to move to Ur of the Chaldees. God says, leave the land that you know. What we sometimes forget is that God gave that very same word to his father, who was called Terah. Not T-E-R-R, whatever, however, O-H. T-E-R-R-A-H. He was called Terah. And, um, uh, and God said to Terah, I want you to move and, and to go into a new season, I mean to go into a new land. And so Terry's father was said, well, I'll do what God tells me to do. And then the Bible says, um, when he got to Genesis 11, for those taking notes, when he got to 11, he set out for Canaan, from Ur, and he came to a place called Haran. And Haran was better than where he'd been, it wasn't as good as where he was going, and he said he settled there. He said, you know, well, I've got my family, it's a bit of a hassle getting all the way from here to there, and I know there's more miles to go, but do you know what? I think I want to stop a little bit short of what God's got for me. And he did. And then God spoke again to his son and said, Abraham, your dad settled for the second best. I want you to get a Canaan. I want you to get into Canaan because, Abraham, it's your now. 
it's your moment. And do you know what? Can I say to those of you who are near and minor agents, awesome that your church has got a wide range of ages and you've got young guys and who've got a heart for God. They're here today, obviously. Some of them are in uh, levels of leadership. But, and, and very often in church, another thing we do is we say, oh, you know, the future's all about the young people. And thank God for emerging leaders. And I spend a lot of my time with young leaders, even at my age. Most of my time in the week is spent mentoring leaders and uh, on a one-to-one basis. But I want to say to those of us who are nearer my age than the young generation, millennial generation, God hasn't finished with you yet either. Because the call to Abraham to go to Canaan was when he was 75 years of age. 75 years of age. Because there's a temptation, as there's temptation in church to say, why would the old days were the good days, or to say, tomorrow's the day is going to happen, to say, well, you know, we've done our bit in church, so let a new generation, it's their day, and we'll just sit and enjoy the meetings. Well, I'm sure that you wouldn't want to get in that. So here's the question as we move on and through the word this morning as we come to um, a close. What is it then that stops us moving from the mountain that's easy to circle, the, the Haran that is better than it used to be, but not as good as it can? What does it? So let's just briefly look at three people. Let's look at Gideon. Now Gideon's name means mighty warrior. So you and I hear a foreign language. We hear Gideon. But when he heard his mother call him Gideon, he would hear, Mighty Warrior, it's time to come in from playing. Mighty Warrior, it's time to um, go to bed. And so he was hearing Mighty Warrior. Israel, as you know, in the book of Judges, they were in a situation where it was horrendous. The enemy had destroyed their land. They were sadistic, the enemy. They wouldn't destroy the harvest. Um, they would wait until, initially, they would wait until the harvest was just about to be ripe. And when all the expectancy was there, they would then come in and destroy the harvest to add extra pain. And so people were forced to get the little, to make bread even, to get the little bit of, uh, uh, of uh, bread that they, they could get made out of actually husks. They were actually nicknamed, historians will tell you, the barley bread people poor quality bread people and so they would have to even hide making bread so Gideon thinks where can I possibly hide because where the enemy won't find me well I know in a wine press because we can't afford bread so we can't afford you know chateau whatever you know we can't afford bread so no one will look for me in a wine press so he gets into a pit when he's in the pit how many people know it's possible when we go into a hard time in our life to get in a pit hey eh? When we, when we feel down. And he's really down, literally, subterranean down in this little pit. And the angel comes from God and says, representing God, and said, hello, mighty warrior. And Gideon does not respond well. He said, do you mind, I know you, and I, I shouldn't be speaking to an agent of God like this, but would you please not call me mighty warrior? Because frankly, if I was mighty, why am I in this mess? If you're asked, have you ever asked the question, honest people here in, in ICL, I'm sure, God, I'm trying to serve you, I'm trying to love you, I'm trying to worship you, I'm doing my best for others. How am I allowed to go through what I'm going through? Have you ever said that question? And he said it. He said, please don't, and he said, can I say another thing to you? Please don't call God mighty. Because if God was mighty, why am I in this mess? Why is Israel in this mess? God had a plan for a new season for Gideon. That new season was not just coming out of his depression, which he'd certainly had. It was to come out of his depression, then move into uh, authority within Israel, then become the chief of the head of the army. So God had an amazing season for him. But he said, I can't, I'm, I can't do it. In fact, do you know what? I haven't owned, I've just about the strength to, not to lead Israel, I've got the strength to get out of the pit. Climbing out of the pit's going to be a, a thing. And you, I found most encouraging words I found in my life, the angel says, I'm not going to ask you to do a massive stuff. I'm not going to ask you to tear down the heathen idols. I'm not asking you to lead Israel. I'm asking you to go in the strength that you've got out of the pit and start the journey into your new season. And he took just the little strength that he had to get out of the pit.
He could have said, it's not my now. My now is when I'm not depressed. My now is when I feel emotionally stronger. And when I'm emotionally stronger, then I'll enter into my new season. But God says, no, in your difficult season, I want you to get out and I want you to move in the strength that you've got. And as you move into that strength, then I'll bless you. Even more well-known person, obviously, is David when he's facing Goliath. Um, we, t we spoke, didn't we, how he was like uh, an afterthought, really. But eventually, uh, he is anointed, and eventually he goes to take cheese sandwiches, the Bible says, bread and cheese, to his brothers on the front line. His brothers are the professional soldiers. And when they get to the front line, his brothers say, why, why have you come here to, uh, why, why have you less, we've given you a few sheep to look after. You know, you're a young guy. Who do you, wh wh you've just come to watch the battle. You've just come for a bit of excitement. You know, we're, we're the main trained soldiers. We're the military men. And wh why are you just interfering? They say, well, my father's asked me to do cheese sandwiches and bring them to you. <laughs> now, let me say something to you. And I notice it around the church, around your church. It's a really positive thing around your church. Uh, amongst many positive things around ICL. Is that here's a young lad who's told that one day he'll be the king. But he's not too big for his boots that he won't serve delivering cheese sandwiches. And there are those around the church here who are willing to come earlier to sort the seats out, to sit at the back out of the spotlight of the, where I'm in at the moment in one sense and do the videoing, um, to, uh, to work with the administration in the background like so many of you do. And uh, You could go and make a huge list. I wouldn't know the names of the people at ICL. You know them. They're coming to your mind now who work behind the scenes. Do you know what? If we're not faithful in the small servant cheese Samuels things of church, we'll never be able to do the big stuff. Because God wants us to be faithful in small things. God says, if, you, if you're capable to look after a few cities, then I'll make you uh, rulers over many cities. So he's put down by his father by being a purveyor of sandwiches. Then his brothers put him down, saying, what do you think you're doing here? Misjudging his motives. And one of the hardest things in church life, and Christians do it to one another, it's bad enough judging our actions, but when they judge our motives, that is really terrible. When your motives, when you've got a pure motive and people don't misjudge what you do, but they judge your motives, then that is really, really painful. And that's what his brothers do. So he's, he's now going down. All He's already small and now he's going down. <laughs> you know, his dad's put him down. His brothers are putting him down. I want to tell you a time when I learned a lesson about judging people. We've got to be very careful. We don't. Bible says judge that you be not judged. Right. See, sometimes I'm going along in the car and I'll get a phone, a mobile go in the car and um, it'll come up on the speaker and Marilyn will say, John, uh, we've run out of milk. Would you mind going into the supermarket and bring a pint of milk home? And I'll say, yeah, I'll do that. So I go into the, I go into the supermarket to get a pint of milk. Now it's full. And there's these long lines of, of people who are queuing up with huge baskets for a week shop. But I've got one pint. And so there is a little queue. I don't know it's the same in Germany, but in England there's a queue for people... If you've got 10 items or less, you can just go there quicker and just go in. Now, I'm going to make a confession. Are you ready for confession time for me? <laughs> I cannot stand in the queue for 10 items and less with my pint of milk without counting what's in the person's basket. In front of me. I cannot do it. I've actually said, I've got to go into it, and I'm, I'm not even going to look. Lord, it's nothing to do with me. I, you know, I'm not going to call security. Excuse me, 11 items. I'm not going to do it. I can't stop myself. Do you know, there's a time in our life when we've got to stop looking in other people's baskets. Hello? Come on. There's a time when we've got to stop looking at other people infringing what God wants. We're not, we're not going to be standing before God on their behalf. We're going to be standing God on our own behalf. And I, and, and I have to discipline myself not to look in other people's basket, but I'll tell you a time worse than that. Before I met Marilyn a long, long time ago, and I was going out with another young lady. Yeah. <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> and obviously, you know, completely second best to what I got in the end. I have to say all of those things to get myself to And we went to church, somebody's church one night, uh, on a Saturday night, and in those days, well, I come from Manchester, and uh, uh, I worked in the city, and and so young people would say, uh, meet for coffee or meet for a bit of lunch, and we'd say, hey, what we go where are we going to go Saturday night? Different churches, 
And uh, anyway, the, so, so well, there's this speaker on, he's, he's from South, I think, uh, the Southern Ireland. Uh, he's, he's an older man, he's from Southern Ireland, and uh, we, we'll, we've never heard him go. So I went to uh, see this guy. Uh, to this meeting where the man was preaching, not particularly to hear him preach, I just wanted somewhere to go with my girlfriend, really. But anyway, <laughs> so I'm sitting there and I notice something incredibly weird about this man. Because in those days, the preacher didn't sit on the front row, he sat on the platform until it was his time to preach. And so I'm, I'm a young guy sitting watching him with my mates and my friends. And when people are standing to worship, he doesn't stand. He doesn't stand. When people are singing, he doesn't sing. He just sits there like this. Then when it's his time to be introduced, he gets up and he's God's man for the hour for 30 minutes. You know, it's all over the place. Why you bang, bang, the word of God, bang, bang, you know, a bit like I was on day one <laughs> before I learned, <laughs> right? And then when he finishes, he goes back in the final songs and he's sitting there. Like so a few weeks later, they're asking where we're going to go, and, you know, and they said, well, there's this guy from, oh, no way in a million years. I am not going to hear him. Because the man is, you know, the man, only, the man is only worshipping God when he's on the spotlight. When he's out of the spotlight, nobody wants to know. He just sits there as if he's not in church. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going. And they said, John, do you know about this guy? I said, don't want to know about the guy. You know, he's only, you know, animated when he's taking part. John, do you know about the guy? I, I said, go on, tell me about the guy. Then they told me about the guy. And I felt this big. This guy lived all his life as an alcoholic. He got cirrhosis of the liver. He was nearly dead. Somebody gave him a Bible. And he read the Bible over and over and over. He read it over and over and over. And he didn't have long to live. He had no energy in the day, about an hour's energy, and he'd be wiped out. And he said, Lord, if you will give, spare me for a few more years, then I will preach your word where the opportunity arises. I'm only ha I may only have an hour, uh, in, uh, half an hour even, to exert my energy. I'll conserve it until I get on. When I've finished, I'll be wiped out till the next day. And John Glass is judging him. John Glass is looking in his basket. You know, we can judge what people do, but I learned from day one don't, don't judge. Every heart's got a secret sorrow. Everybody's going through stuff in their life. And we need to just not judge the pain. Hurt people hurt people. And sometimes the hurt that we get comes out of hurt that they've got. And sometimes if we're really trying to be mature Christians, we try to look behind the hurt to where it was. And I learned a huge lesson that day. And I would like to say I've always kept to it. Fortunately, I haven't. There are times when I have misjudged people over the next 50 years, but that happens. So Gideon could have said, uh, when I'm less depressed, that will be my no motive. Now, so David, he's in a situation, and he now goes back to David, and he says, um, well, I've been put down by my dad being given cheese sandwiches. Now you're putting me down. It's your question, why are you not as trained soldiers fighting the, fighting the giant? Oh, well, it's not our now moment. <laughs> you know, he's a bit bigger than us. It's not our now moment. So why is the king Saul not doing it? Because the Bible says Saul was head and shoulders in height above everybody in Israel. He was the tallest man in Israel by uh, a meter. No, almost a meter. Well, the king doesn't think it's his now moment at the moment. <laughs> All right? He says, well, I, only be, I may only be a little kid. But my father's put me down, you've put me down, the king has probably put me down. He goes in front of, of, of Goliath and he says, who do you think you're coming with your sticks and stones? I'm going to give your body to the birds of the air. So now the enemy's putting him down. But he said, you know what, it's my now moment. The king's not doing it. The king's not doing it. My brothers are not doing it. And I might be small. I, he, what, what I have said, well, do you know, my now moment is when I put on about 200 pounds I've done a bit of a working out and grown another meter or so and then it'll be my time to fight giants. Listen, we don't have that luxury in our world. We can't wait until we're perfect. If God has challenged us to move on to a new season, it may not be an ideal time in our life. What about De Deborah? Deborah looks at, a, again, Israel surrounded by the enemy. Deborah could have looked at, um, to her husband, um, Lapidoth which may, name means fiery torch, incidentally. Not much of a fiery torch, unfortunately, a bit of a damp squib. 
You've got a great name. You've got a great name. Why don't you lead Israel? Well, it's not my now moment. So what about then, why not Barak? Because he is the, he's the main boy. He's the main man. Well, his name means lightning, incidentally. And he wasn't shining too bright. I, I don't think it's not right. Just not right for us. When she rises as a woman to lead Israel into victory, we know of Mary's Magnificat when she was conceived by the Holy Spirit to carry Jesus and she says, my soul doth magnify the Lord, my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour. You go and look at the Magnificat of Deborah. She says, life in Israel cease until I, a woman, arose in her now moment, we will say. So what are we trying to say? And I'm going to give one more illustration before we pray. If only I was less depressed, well, perhaps then that's my now moment to a new season. If only I was stronger or taller in my spiritual life, then I'd take on the giants. If only I wasn't a woman, then I would want to rise to my destiny, but I am a woman, so let the men do it. Incidentally, the future of the church does not depend upon strong women when, because in her day, weak men, and men were around. The future of the, of the church depends in this nation on strong women rising alongside strong men to do the work of God. But let's go back to the age thing now and we go back to the spies. We started with the spies in the first session. We're going to end it now in our final session. Twelve spies, ten of them, I read the names out, only one person knew who those people were. Uh, if you'd asked me sometime, I wouldn't know who they were. We all know Caleb and Joshua. Well, Caleb would have been in his 40s. Caleb then got into his 80s. And Caleb got into his 80s and they wanted to honor the old guy. And um, so the leaders of Israel said, I'd like Caleb to come forward, we've got a present for you. So they bring Caleb forward. This old guy comes out, 85 years of age, and he says, uh, well, we're going to give you a gift, because, you know, many years ago, 45, would it be 45 years ago, Caleb, when you um, had all the faith to go into the promised land and go into a new season? Yeah, it was, about that, 45 years. He said, we've got a present for you. He said, what is it? It's over there. It's a lovely little field. We've got you an allotment. <laughs> we've got you a little field it's a lovely little allotment not too demanding because you're 85 and we don't know if there's a shed at the end or not the Bible doesn't say it just says there's a little field there you can just pot around with your little you know old boy you can go around with your little um, what do you call wheelbarrow and you can get a few cabbages there and take them home and you know you know you were great over the old days you know but you know you're not 40 anymore so this guy, who was 85 years of age, instead of saying, oh, thanks a million, you're awesome. Oh, do you know, Jesus, God was wonderful to me 45 years ago. World's changed, though. I've got old, I've got arthritis, I've got all this stuff going on. He didn't say that. He said, excuse me, can you just keep your field? Do you mind keeping the allotment? I'm not interested. i tell you what I am interested in. There's a mountain over there. Could you give me that mountain? Read the story. And they said, well, excuse me, <laughs> you're 85. You can hardly get up the stairs. You're wanting in the mountain. And he said, I'll tell you another thing about the mountain. That mountain is full of enemies. It's not vacant possession. He said, well, that's okay. He said, because I might be older at 85 than I was at 40. I might be weaker, but my God at 40, when I was 40, is as strong today as when I was 80. Give me the mountain. Give me the mountain. And so they gave him the mountain. Well, never believe a preacher when he says he's about to come to the end. Because <laughs> I've just thought of another woman I want to close with now. Now this woman, and, oof, sorry. This woman's name's AXA. Sounds like an insurance company, but that's, that's AXA. She is A-X-S-A-H. That's AXA. And uh, one day, her dad came to her and said, Axa, uh, I've got an amazing thing for you. You'll never believe it. What have I done? I bought you some fields, and they're going to be your own field. And uh, you've got to understand the context of the day. Women never got inheritances in, the, in that culture. If a man had two sons and five daughters, he divided his will into three pieces one piece he would give 
to his second born son, two pieces he would give to his first born son, and nothing would go to the girls. That was, that was the culture. So for a father to say to a daughter, not only am I going to give you land, but I'm going to give it to you while you and I are still alive, she would have been doing double somersaults in ex ecstasy. But she looks at the land and she's, well, it's, it's all right. I suppose it's all right. But I, I can read maps. You know, women can, women can read maps. <laughs> and she says, uh, I can read maps here. And uh, I've just noticed that uh, if you just were to expand the boundaries of what you're giving me, you've just missed out, Dad. You've missed out <laughs> you've, some springs of water. You've given me, it's all right what you've given me. But if you'd have just pushed those boundaries a little bit, it would be much better. How cheeky until you realize who her dad was Caleb Caleb wanted more and his kids picked up something in their spirit and they wanted more can I say to parents you know what you're birthing in your new season will affect your kids for good because they'll catch your spirit they'll catch your faith they'll catch your heart we can't guarantee it because I know the best parents in the world whose kids have gone away from God it is not the parents fault because God does not bring us in families we all have to make an independent decision and if your kids are away from God or uh, do not consider yourself a bad parent it, it is, do not believe it's your because, but I will tell you this if you're a woman of faith and you're a grandmother of faith and you're a grandfather of faith it will affect your kids and the chances are it will be a good time leaders, can I say to you as leaders I've had leaders, you know, not saying where, but I, I've had leaders in my church years and years gone by, and uh, they would get to the front and encourage me to encourage the congregation to be at the prayer meeting and encourage the congregation to do this and that and that. And, that. and the congregation are hearing words, but they're saying, I don't see the leaders at the prayer meeting. See? So we have got to be people, I as a leader, all the you guys, elders, deacons, whatever, worship leaders, uh, whatever you are in the church, all of us as leaders, we have to realize that if we have a Caleb spirit, there'll be an axe of watching and catching that heart. And so we have a responsibility. So let's pray together. Father, thank you for the new season. We're looking out the window and see what a glorious sight. What a, you know, that's why we understand, Lord, why in Romans 1 it says that the, the atheist is left without excuse when they see creation. Because the design demands a designer. And so, Father, when we think of your goodness, we're left without excuse. When we think, Lord, of, of all that you have provided for us. And, Lord, we're, we're aware of your greatness. We've been singing, how great is our God. But our problem is not in understanding that you're great. Our problem, Lord, my problem is sometimes that I realize that I am less than I wish I was. But you don't wait until I'm tall enough to fight giants, until I am emotionally strong enough to get out of, uh, out of wine presses to lead armies. You don't wait until uh, for, for other factors. What you're saying, this is our now. And so, Father, as, we, as I conclude my part in the message and, and as we conclude our time together eventually, we thank you for the new season. Give us the faith in spite of our perceived limitations to move into everything you've got for us. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.